One of the Pali terms for Brahma Viharas is Apamanya. It means immeasurable, unlimited. And there are two ways in which it is unlimited. One is you extend these attitudes to everybody, no matter who. People you like, people you don't like. People who have been behaving, behaving well, people who haven't been behaving well. That gets to the second meaning. You spread it to people regardless of what they've been doing. Because after all, remember, why are you spreading these attitudes? The primary one is to protect yourself from doing unskillful things. If you have ill will for anybody, it's very easy to do unskillful things to those people. And that becomes your karma. So remember, you're not doing it for them. You're doing it primarily for yourself. And the question of whether they deserve your goodwill or don't deserve your goodwill, that shouldn't come into the equation. Questions of deserving don't matter right here. Because if you're going to be skillful only to people you feel deserve your kindness or your goodness, there are going to be a lot of limitations on your goodness. Do you want that? And we're not talking about love here, or even loving kindness. Just simple goodwill, wishing people to be happy. Now this doesn't mean wishing that they'll be happy no matter what they do, or happy as they are regardless of what they're doing. Your metta is there for them regardless of what they're doing, but the metta means may they learn to behave in a skillful way themselves, and that you'd be happy to help them in that direction. After all, how does the Buddha say you harm other people? You harm them not so much by killing or stealing their things or breaking the precepts. You harm yourself by breaking the precepts. You harm them by getting them to break the precepts. You realize their happiness has to come from their actions. Similarly, you help them by getting them not to break the precepts. You also help them by encouraging them to overcome their passion, their aversion, their delusion. So those are the things you're willing to do based on your goodwill. Now, there will be times when you can't do them, in which case you have to have equanimity. But the underlying motive is always there, goodwill. So it's good to practice making it immeasurable. There's a passage in the canon that's often translated as, just as a mother loves her only child, you should have the same love for all beings. That's the translation, but it's a wrong translation. A more accurate one is, just as a mother protects her only child, you should protect your goodwill toward all beings. That means regardless of what they do, regardless of who they are, you try to maintain this attitude of goodwill. And you cherish it, you protect it, because you realize your well-being depends on it. After all, you're here meditating. It's based on your goodwill for yourself, and then by extension, goodwill for others. So the underlying motive for the practice all the way through is goodwill. And think of that image of the, the bandits. The Buddha said, if someone has pinned you down, you've got two bandits with a two-handled saw, and they're cutting you up into little pieces, they've overpowered you, there's nothing you can do about what they're doing, you still should have goodwill for them. And again, this is for your own good. This is for your own good. Because if you were to die at that moment with ill will, You'd go to a bad place, be reborn with a motive of wanting to get revenge, and that would be a waste of a good lifetime. So regardless of what people are doing, you want to maintain that attitude of goodwill. 
In fact, you want to make it more reliable than a mother's love. As we, as we all know, our mothers love us up to a certain point. There are certain things that you can do that would make your mother exasperated with you, or more than exasperated with you. But you want to develop goodwill in a way that doesn't have those limitations. The images the Buddha gives are large. Goodwill like the entire earth. Goodwill like the river Ganges, which is a broad, huge river. Goodwill like space. Space has no limitations at all. So regardless of what other people do, your basic attitude has to be, may this person be happy. Now that may mean, may this person change his or her ways. But you shouldn't let their behavior get in the way of your goodwill, because that's placing a limitation on your own heart and your own mind. Because remember, we're training both the heart and the mind. The Pali term jitta. We're talking about singleness of mind. Well, it's also singleness of heart. You're trying to create a, a heart that's dedicated to one big purpose, which is to follow the noble path, engage in the noble search which is a search for happiness that doesn't die. And it's going to involve learning how to find that happiness in a way that doesn't harm anybody. It requires both the heart and the mind. Heart in the sense of your intentions, what you will, what you aspire to in life. Your mind in the sense of trying to figure things out. How do you find a happiness like that? So by training yourself in the Brahma Viharas, you're training both the heart and the mind. The heart in the sense of realizing that if you want happiness, it can't cause harm to anybody else. So you have to include everybody in your wish for happiness. And then engage the mind and to figure out how you can reason with your heart, so be willing to have that attitude. It's all too easy to say, well, these are people which is like just can't have goodwill for it because they've been behaving so horribly. That's a human attitude. We're trying to develop a Brahma attitude, and a Brahma attitude is limitless. And human attitudes, the ones you see all over the world. My group of people versus that group of people. The people I love versus the people I hate. The human mind tends to be very divisive, very partial. The human heart tends to be very partial. So we're trying to lift both the heart and the mind to a Brahma level, where you can see that you don't gain any benefit from other people's suffering at all. We read about investors saying that the economy is such that we have to inflict a little pain on other people so that we can gain what we want. Well, that's the human attitude. And it's nothing to admire. So that's writ large. But a lot of us in our daily lives find people that are really hard to have goodwill for, and then we just give up. But it means we're giving up on our own desire for true happiness. If you want to be truly happy, you have to figure out, how can I have goodwill for everybody? And what does it mean to have goodwill for everybody? And you can learn to think in ways that make it possible. Because as I said, it's not simply a wish that whatever people are doing, may they be happy doing that. It's more, if they're doing unskillful things, may they see the error of their ways, be inspired to change their ways. And that's a wish you can have for anybody. Now part of the mind will say, well, I'd like to see so-and-so suffer first. But why? Is that a part of your own heart and mind that you want to encourage? So by holding yourself to an unlimited standard like this, you help to expose areas of the heart and of the mind 
that tend to get missed when you simply focus on the breath or focus on whatever your topic of mindfulness might be. Because this too is a kind of mindfulness. It doesn't come under the four establishings of mindfulness, but it's an important mindfulness to inform the entirety of your practice. Because you want the entire heart and the entire mind to gain freedom. It's on both sides of the jitta have to be trained. Of course, it's not just goodwill in the Brahma Viharas. It goes on to compassion. You see somebody suffering, and instead of thinking, well, they, they're getting what they deserve, you remind yourself, I could be in a situation like that myself. I have been in the past many times, and I could be again if I'm not careful. How would I like people to treat me? Or when you see someone who's happy, this is a real test for your goodwill. There are a lot of people who are happy receiving the results of their past good actions, but they're abusing their happiness. They're abusing their power, their beauty, their wealth. So here you are. You tell yourself you want all beings to be happy. Well, this is what it looks like. Happy beings. So you realize in a case like that, your empathetic joy has to be paired with compassion. Here are people who have the results of their good past actions, but they're not using them wisely. You have to feel sorry for them. And then equanimity for the times when you can't make a change in other people's behavior, or there are things in your own mind that you can't change yet. You're equanimous about them. But that doesn't mean you give up on them. You certainly don't give up on yourself. It means simply that you learn to have the right time and place for expressing your goodwill, acting on your goodwill, and other times where you have to hold back a little bit, not out of a lack of goodwill, but simply out of wisdom, that you try to figure out what would be the best way to influence this person. And if the opportunity doesn't come yet, well, look for the times when it will come. As you hold your heart and mind to this standard, you find that you stretch yourself, you grow. And the limitations that seem only natural or only human take on a new meaning. When we say something's only natural, it's usually an excuse. Well, it's just the natural way to do things. But the phrase can also mean, well, that's all it is. It's just natural. You want something better than that. The same with, it's only human. You want something better than human. So you have to make your own heart and mind more than human. It may sound like a tall order, but it is possible. This is one of the Buddha's gifts to us, is stretching our ideas of what is humanly possible and how we can transcend our normal limits of what's ordinarily human. You can think of that story of Richard Feynman. In addition to being a physicist, he liked to play the bongos. Someone wrote a letter to him one time saying, I really appreciate the fact that you play the bongos. It makes you human. And Feynman wrote back a blistering letter saying, isn't doing physics human as well? It's part of our human capability, that we can figure things out. And it's the same with the path, even more so with the path. This is the best thing a human being can do, the best thing any being can do. After all, the Buddha transcended even the devas and the brahmas. Those passages where he talks about consciousness without surface, they all come in, or both of them, 
come in contact where we're showing how the Buddha knows more than Brahmas know. He's attained something that Brahmas can't fathom. So as we stretch ourselves to have a Brahma attitude, remember there's more. But stretching ourselves to that Brahma level gets us closer to going beyond them. <laughs>